our next speaker, really unique uh, from teaching at Stanford, teaching in Japan, uh, you know, the VR glove that you may have seen in the past. Uh, we, got, we got one of these three people that should be almost in the vision side, but we have them in application, which is exciting. You're crossing both boundaries. Uh, I th are you coming in from Palo Alto? Are you up here? Microphone's up here. No, Clickers right here. I, I got everything. Get up here. Come on up here. I, don't, I haven't met you yet. So, Mark, where are you based? Uh, Los Angeles. You're right here. So an easy drive for you, right? Uh, it would be hard uh, coming from San Francisco. Would have been easier. <laughs> it would have been easier. Yeah. You know why they call it the 405? Because uh, it takes about four or five hours to drive yeah. down. You know. <laughs> well, welcome. Impress us, okay? Oh, thank thanks, you, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate All right. it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I was in San Diego 20, 30 years ago, and I got to be in a flight simulator. It was a helicopter flight simulator, uh, military on uh, Coronado Island. And it was about 2 in the morning. I had not gotten much sleep. And I was with a guy I work with. And he was kind of an, an, an In fact, um, it was my job the next day to let him go. So we're in the flight simulator. We could only get there at 2 in the morning. We're flying around. And he's going to crash it in the Coronado Bay Bridge. Now, I don't know if you've seen flight simulators like that, but they're full six degree of freedom. So They've got these robotic arms underneath that can pitch the whole platform around, and they've got video all the way around you. So you really feel like you're there. If you notice this little platform right here, that platform brings you in, then they pull the platform back, and there's this little tiny window in the back, about that big. And that's the only thing you can see of the real world. So we're strapped in with our seat belts. He's flying. He's about to crash on the Coronado Bay Bridge. And for a moment, I thought to myself, what if this isn't a simulator? then this guy's about to kill me. So I really have to like take the controls away from him because he obviously is going to crash. And I undid my seatbelt to get up and turn around to see if I could look through that little window and really make sure that it was a simulator. I truly, for that brief moment, couldn't tell the difference. And there's always been this quest to be exactly somewhere. Flight simulator started, this one I think is from 1910. You really want to make a person feel like they're flying? They've gotten a lot more sophisticated, and they really make you feel exactly like you're there. So that's just a blast. You can, <laughs> you can totally make somebody feel like you're somewhere else, but even more importantly, you can start to create worlds that have never existed in there before. You can do things other than a helicopter. So let me start with part of my work. I'm currently at the Institute of Creative Technologies in the School of Cinematic Arts at USC. Um, slides are a bit out of order. There's a whole bunch of people I work with at USC, um, also at the School of Cinematic Arts, and then there'll be some work with Fake Space Labs as well. At USC, the US Army stood up an institute to create simulations that are used for virtual training. And if you want to train a soldier, then you've got a problem. They've got to feel like they're walking around. Well, that's kind of impractical, but you want to stretch your virtual training space. So one of the first experiments we've just concluded is a way to stretch space by doing redirection. And there's supposed to be a video playing right there. I'll back up a slide and then come back down into it. OK, so stretching space is, uh, is something you want to do. You put somebody in a virtual environment. They have a head-mounted display on. They've got tracking gear all over them. But the space is inherently limited. So how can I make that space feel unlimited? So the first trick was invented by Evan Suma, who's a postdoc in our lab. And it's called change blindness. In this video, you'll see uh, the user in the head mount is over there. The user is seeing this scene here, which is a Humvee. If it's possible to not have the spot follow me, it might work a little better for this one. So here the user's walking down a gravel pathway. And the user's actually walking down a gravel pathway there. And the plan view of what they're doing is they're about to walk into this room here, and they're searching for a weapons cache. So they turn left, and they go into the room. That's what it looks like to them. They're looking back out the window at the Humvee. One of the things we started experimenting with here was having real gravel on the floor, so you actually feel the crunch of that gravel path. They go in, and they're instructed to look in the boxes and see it now. What just happened? When he looked in the boxes, the room was rotated by 90 degrees, or more importantly, the door was rotated to the other wall. So the door has had a 90-degree shift. It turns out you don't notice this. You go into the room, you look at the thing, you turn around, the door just went to the other wall, but in the corner, and you don't notice it. So when you leave, you've been redirected. He's right back where he started from. But he thinks he just left the room, and now he's walking down again. 
So you can just daisy chain these buildings and have them go infinitely down. And he keeps reinforcing the fact that he's in the right place because he feels the gravel on his feet. Evan just completed a study of this and also back uh, his doctoral work. And out of 70 users, one user noticed that the door had moved. And even more interesting is afterwards, you can ask the user to draw a map of what they just experienced. And the maps are accurate to the virtual world that you want to show. So that's one way to stretch space. Another one is to have the real world is represented in red and the, the virtual one is in blue. So we make a virtual space that's about twice as large. And on this one, the task is to push a litter, which is you know, the thing they put people on in the hospital to push them around, you'll see it in a second, uh, through a hospital. But there's a Wii Fit board on there that's sensing how hard you push. So if you push really hard, what we do is we just cheat and make the world move twice as fast by you. But you're so busy pushing that it feels right for the world to be moving faster. So that's what you see. And right there, that's tw two times as fast of a motion. And then when the person comes around the corner, they're, they're not pushing as hard because they back off, so it slows down. And then it'll redirect again. And we get about a two-time change in motion. This one we haven't done a study on yet, and we don't actually understand what's going on with it. But we do know that the real world's in blue, but the virtual world you think you're in is, um, is in red, and the virtual world is in blue. So this is one example of really making you feel like you're somewhere else, but cheating to do it. So you feel like you're really in that room that's twice as large. Virtual humans are another major effort, and Jackie Mori will be speaking of that later in the day. But really quickly, I just want to look at the display technologies and how they affect a virtual human from being there with you. Small monitors are little virtual people. They don't feel very real. Uh, Gerald Pear, which initiated the lab, worked on this system, which used a flat screen but behind a door. So you had the propping around it, just like a virtual flat, to make it feel real. And you'd have to make you know, good guy, bad guy decisions. This is the trans screen, which Gerald also championed at the lab. And it's a semi-transparent screen that almost looks holographic. So you can start mixing the person with some flats and some props. And then finally, this is a project they did with Andrew Jones and Paul DeBevick at the lab. And it does a real-time facial scan to create what really is the light field that would come off the face. This is, it, it, it really does Princess Leia. Um, So this whole talk so far has been about bringing people from here and getting them to there, so they really feel like they're somewhere. That's a time left? Oops. <laughs> um, what's more interesting is bringing them from here to somewhere else. And that's where the artistic side of immersion really comes into play. In particular, this is something one of my cinema students did. It's one thing to have a virtual character, but he started thinking about the character, and as you walk up to him, he should really react to you. And you get near, and he does this. <laughs> and to me, it's an example of how if we allow ourselves to become more abstract with our data, we can really make people feel deeper there. And I have to ask, can I have three minutes to go over, or do you want me to stick to that? I burned a lot of time on that laptop thing. OK, thank you. So there's a lot of pieces that I can show some other time that are ways of making things more abstract. But one in particular, uh, Kevin, if you could grab the mouse and click on the upper left video. I'm just going to talk about it. You can fly like a bird in a virtual environment by putting your hands to your side. And you think that's the way you want to fly. You just sort of swoop around like this. But one experiment we did was you fly with your hand. And you just fly a virtual plane with your hand like this. And you sort of like your hand outside of a car window. And that turns out to be a lot more fun. And the thing I really want to get across today is that this is all pretty old work, the idea of bringing you from here to there to an abstract world. But what's happening these days is that we're going from there, which is this artificial sort of abstract virtual environment, and we're coming back to here, which is in the real world. And I think what this conference is about is about how immersion's gone full circle. It's gone from being this heavy-duty, wearing head mounts virtual reality experience, which is sort of my original background, to where people are going now, which is bringing it right back on the stage here. But we're not bringing it back where we have to wear the head mount. So one example is this game here, which is called Flower. It's done by a student at USC called Kelly Santiago. And it's exactly the using your hand to fly around, but you don't need to have a head mount on your hand anymore. They just use a Sony PlayStation controller. You fly through this gorgeous world of grass. 
and you get that wonderful experience of flying. And what I'd like to conclude with that is that there's these nuggets that we can find in the virtual environments of wearing head mounts. And what we have to do is find ways of bringing those nuggets from that world, that here, into VR, which is there, and then back into the real world again. But the one thing I'd ask as a takeaway that I'm, I'm begging people to realize is that we can't lose here. If you watch somebody using an iPhone, there's a lot of power that really was started 20 years ago of what immersion is about, about teleconferencing, about telepresence, about all these things, and it's all on your iPhone now. But the problem is that we're forgetting that it's immersive and that this person's lost. And we have a lot of social situations and with the communications theme where we're losing people, these virtual environments, because we're not bringing them back here at the same time. So that's enough here's and there's, I think. And with that, I'll conclude.